includes John Bailey. John Bailey is known to almost everybody uh, in the room. Very eminent speaker, ERCP endoscopy expert. Uh, was, was at Duke where he ran their ERCP program for many years. <clears throat> and recently left, I guess just last year, and is now running the ERCP slash advanced endoscopy program at Wake Forest. So he stayed within the ACC <coughs> and within the state, but um, is now in a different institution. Uh, John, again, is a renowned speaker, uh, renowned expert, a uh, great writer. Uh, John was one of my mentors uh, when I trained, and people always know about John as a speaker and John as an endoscopy expert. One thing I'm sure nobody knows is that he's the best editor I've ever had, and I've written a lot of different stuff in different places. And, and whenever I write something, I give it to John, and I, I get it back marked up with very nice script, by the way, John. And the <laughs> corrections he made were always unbelievably good. I, I would make those corrections and say, wow, this guy writes a hell of a lot better than I do. Best editor I ever had. So, and you're also associated for ACG, I think, right? For American right, John. Right, yeah, for Journal of Astronomy. <coughs> and um, without any further ado, John, thanks for coming. It's a long distance from North Carolina here. Unfortunately, because of requirements, he's going to have to fly back tonight. But um, thanks a lot for coming all the way here. Oh, sure. <clears throat> well, thanks very much for that. Um, <clears throat> pleased to, to be here. Uh, this is, uh, you don't know any of these people, but uh, these are uh, a group of four of our advanced trainees that we had in the last couple of years. And one of my great pleasures at, at Duke was to work with great fellows. And I have to say that uh, Steve was, uh, in my mind, uh, unquestionably one of the best fellows we ever had at Duke, uh, a great doctor, did a lot of good writing himself and research and stuff and uh, it's been great for me to be able to uh, keep up with him and at a time when the rewards of academia are going away I mean it seemed I seem to spend most of my time doing things that are not academic anymore and uh, we're all on the the money-making hamster wheel but uh, certainly working with with bright fellows is still one of the rewards uh, I just showed this for a little nostalgia for you Steve the Duke thing Thank you, John. Um, and of course, uh, that's still in my blood, but now I'm over at this institution. This is, uh, they used to call it Bowman Gray, I guess, because Bowman Gray was the philanthropist who initially set up Wake Forest, but now it's uh, got a very fancy name, which is Wake Forest University Health Sciences. And it's a surprisingly big institution. It's got 50% more beds than Duke has. It's got almost 1,000 beds. and. Uh, a lot of sick patients. So they have a fairly big basic science side to it too, so it's not entirely out in the boonies, but it, it, is, it is a little different. And of course, with the territory, you have to be a demon deacon, and, and they're not doing so well. <laughs> they don't have such a great team, but uh, nice place, a uh, nice group of people to work with. Um, <clears throat> we were kind of talking about this last night, but uh, I go back far enough with Steve that he remembers my kids at this stage. This is my wife, Alison, and uh, this is Katie and this is Christopher and they have a tendency of growing up, uh, this is about two years ago but Katie's now about to graduate as a senior from UNC in journalism and psychology and Chris is uh, about to go on some, some drinking scholarship to UNC. <laughs> he, want, he wants to be a doctor but he wants to do that thing where you go straight to the 400,000 a year and the Lamborghini without going to college so we're having to have that discussion. Um, <clears throat> my wife uh, is a physician, but uh, 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 in later years got into volunteering a lot. One of the things she does is volunteer at the animal shelter in Durham. So dogs are everywhere. And so if you come to my house, it's pretty much owned by the dogs. We have our two elderly spaniels. This is our killer attack spaniel, Shona. And this is Molly, who's our half sister, who doesn't just kind of lies around all day. Uh, this is Jethro, who's uh, our latest addition, who's our little black and tan coonhound. And Jethro has to be ever vigilant for his enemy, the cat next door. So. <laughs> I wonder if it would be better with the lights down again, because most of these are show and tell I'm going to show. It's up to you, uh, but uh, you might see these things better. The other thing that uh, Steve might remember is my, my passion for flying, and uh, that's why the flying videos come up. This is actually taken over Beaufort Airport uh, down at the coast in North Carolina, one of my favorite places to fly in, in the summertime. So why am I showing uh, the Ten Commandments here? 
Uh, when, I, when I talked to Steve, uh, he said, you know, you can talk about anything you want to, really, and you can decide how you want to do this. So I'm going to diverge in a major way from the program, because uh, I thought you didn't really need a, a 40 minutes or whatever in ELCP training and those kind of things. And so I've got a couple, actually I've got three little, little talks of which we can do two or three, depending on how the time goes, we'll take breaks and stuff. But I think they're on, on very clinically relevant things to you guys. First thing I was going to talk about is a talk I give, uh, which I call Dr. Bailey's Ten Commandments of VLCP or Billary Pancreatic. And, um, so we're not going to be talking about, about Charlton Heston and, and the Biblical Ten Commandments alone. No, nobody did it better uh, than old uh, Charlton. And as you know, in, in his latter days, he was known as, as Guns and Moses, right? When he was with the NRA. <clears throat> Uh, we're not going to talk about Justice uh, Roy Moore either. You remember he got into a bit of excitement uh, when he had this thing in his court that eventually got taken away the Ten Commandments on a block of granite in the front of his courthouse and the, the civil liberties people said this was, uh, this was a, has to be ever vigilant for his enemy, the cat next door. <laughs> I wonder if it would be better with the lights down again, because most of these are show and tell I'm going to show. It's up to you, uh, but uh, you might see these things better. The other thing that uh, Steve might remember is my, my passion for flying, and uh, that's why the flying videos come up. This is actually taken over Beaufort to airport uh, down at the coast in North Carolina, one of my favorite places to fly in, in the summertime. So why am I showing uh, the Ten Commandments here? Uh, when, I, when I talked to Steve, uh, he said, you know, you can talk about anything you want to, really, and you can decide how you want to do this. So I'm going to diverge in a major way from the program, because uh, I thought you didn't really need a, a 40 minutes or whatever in ELCP training and those kind of things. And so I've got a couple, actually, I've got three little, little talks of which we can do two or three, depending on how the time goes. We'll take breaks and stuff. But I think they're on, on very clinically relevant things to you guys. First thing I was going to talk about is a talk I give, uh, which I call Dr. Bailey's Ten Commandments of VLCP or Billary Pancreatic. And, um, so we're not going to be talking about, about Charlton Heston and, and the Biblical Ten Commandments alone. No, nobody did it better uh, than old uh, Charlton. And as you know, in, in his latter days, he was known as, as Guns and Moses, right, when he was with the NRA. <clears throat> Uh, we're not going to talk about Justice uh, Roy Moore either. You remember he got into a bit of excitement uh, when he had this thing in his court that eventually got taken away the Ten Commandments on a block of granite in the front of his courthouse. And the, the civil liberties people said this was, uh, this was a bit of extra pressure we didn't need, so they took that away. I'm not going to talk about the Ten Commandments Bible board game, which I'm sure most of us have at home. I do like these Ten Commandments. These are Ten Commandments for people in New York, and this includes silence thy cell phone whilst in the theater, for God's sake, was thou sired in New Jersey, <laughs> and speak not thy bomb joke while in the security line. So I'm not going to cover any of those ones. Um, I'm going to try not to tell you any lies either. As you can see, I've kind of got into this video thing. And it, um, but people often ask me uh, to talk about do's and don'ts. And there's a lot of stuff in, in the literature right now about medical legal stuff. Those of you who got this month's gastrointestinal endoscopy, there's a kind of fluffy piece by Peter Cotton on looking at 59 cases that he was an expert witness in, um, in medical legal stuff for cases that were bad outcomes of ERCP. And there's some accompanying little editorials on it. And, so there's a lot of buzz about do's and don'ts. So as a lot of this is very anecdotal, I thought, well, why not, why not share my own prejudices? So they, these are so, somewhat tongue-in-cheek and certainly not intended to, to poke any fun at any religious thing, but I've, I've styled them in the forms of commandments. So my number one commandment, <clears throat> and they're not necessarily in order of importance, but is that I shall not undertake ERCP in any patient, especially a woman, with normal amylase, lipase, LFTs, a normal bile duct diameter, with the intention of diagnosing post-cholecystectomy, right hypochondrial or epigastric pain, unless I can do manometry. If you want to get yourself sued doing ELCP, do these patients. You now, young women with right upper quadrant pain and nothing else should have a big flashing sign, danger Will Robinson, when they come into your office. Seriously, they're a danger to your practice because 
they'll they'll beg, borrow, steal, whatever to get an ERCP, and then when you give them terrible post ERCP pancreatitis, they will successfully sue you because there's enough people out there writing that you shouldn't do these patients without, unless in the context of manometry that that if you're not talking sphincter dysfunction, not send them to a tertiary center, you are toast. So, you know, we could talk about this and you'll be delighted to know I'm not going to really. Uh, if you want to know my opinions about sphincter dysfunction, I, I wrote an editorial that I took some heat for in the Red Journal three or four months ago, uh, really questioning what the heck we're doing with this. You know, type 1 <clears throat> SOD is a real disease, it's, but it's, it isn't really SOD, it's papillary stenosis. Type 2, I see a few of, they're all type 3s, they're all people with pain and nothing else. And we really need to reclassify this, but until we can do it better, if you're going to call these people type 3, they need to have a manometry proving that they have sphincter dysfunction. So I would say that those patients you should not you know, if the issue comes up, is this sphincter of body dysfunction? I don't know where you send you. I know you send some stuff to Dick Kazarek and stuff. But if you want to protect yourself, don't do it. Unless you're somebody who's done a lot of ERCP, you've got into practice, you've got set up, you're, you're, you're setting yourself up to be a, a local expert, don't do it. You know, if I had a dollar for every time I've looked at a medical legal case and heard in a deposition, a gastroenterologist said, I wish I'd never met this patient, I wish I'd never thought of ERCP, I'd be rich. So my second commandment is, I shall not perform biliary sphincterotomy for presumed or proven sphincter of dysfunction without at least putting a pancreatic stent in. And um, this, this has become a kind of big area and it's important for you to know about medical legally because... There are a number of papers now in the literature that show very convincingly that if you stent the pancreatic duct in a situation where there's significant risk of pancreatitis after your manipulations, that you can at least avoid the worst end of the spectrum of post ERCP pancreatitis, i.e. necrotizing pancreatitis. It may not avoid them having a night of pain and needing admitted, but they won't get terrible pancreatic necrosis. And the size of the stents has gone down and down and down. This is the sort of latest iteration, which is the single pigtail three French stent that has to go over a pretty skinny little wire, an 018. And these are designed to fall out in a day or two, and they almost all do. And uh, there's enough of it. The, the lawyers all know this now. And, you know, the people that know the literature, it's not me, it's not you, it's the lawyers, because they send their nurses that they, 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 they hire to help them with their cases to go and trawl the literature and they and they also go to websites. Now if you go to the website for example on ERCP and Lap Coley you'll get about 10 things that are all law offices telling you how to sue people who've had a bad outcome of ERCP. The lawyers research this and they share the information about it. And just like you come here for this course they go places for a weekend to learn how to successfully sue Dr. Schutz for his post ESP pancreatitis. It's down to that level. I mean, they, they look at all the cases, what the successful ploys have been to get the jury convinced this was malpractice. They know the literature now. They know, and I can't, <clears throat> I can't defend you if you don't, you know, if you're in a risky situation and you haven't at least thought of stenting the pancreatic duct and they get a terrible outcome. It's very hard to defend you because that literature's out there. So I would say if you're going to be somebody doing any amount of ERCP, and particularly in patients who uh, are risky, and about the only non-risky ones are old ladies with big stones, you should think about putting a stent in the pancreatic duct. I've never really regretted doing it, but I've read it, regretted plenty not doing it. The one time it's a little difficult is if there's a loop-de-loop -loop with so-called ANSA or a you know, sharp turn-off of the pancreatic duct, sometimes the guide wire will not go around the corner. But uh, you should at least think about doing that. Are any of you doing putting in pancreatic stents or you do? I think it's uh, I think it's a good thing to do. This is a an older slide and I would use a smaller stent than this but this is a patient that I had to needle knife to get into the bile duct and uh, one, one good way to get into the bile duct if you can't get in is if, if you're in the pancreatic duct anyway put a stent in there and then just cut up over it or if, if you have your papillotome you know, because you've got one hole filled, there's only one other place for it to go. And often, once you have the stent in there, the, the papillotome or, or your cannula will go straight into the bile duct. But if you've done that, then I leave the stent in there. This happens to be a flanged uh, five French stent. But I will leave a stent in there. It only has to stay in a day or so. And the thought is that what causes the pancreatitis is edema 
closing off the the pancreatic orifice. So, so be liberal with using these. I hear a lot of people say, well, I don't want to be a pancreatic endotherapist. That was one of the topics that Steve gave me to talk about, you know, pancreatic endotherapy. Unfortunately now, if you're going to be a, an ERCP person, you've got to be a pancreatic endotherapist. And anyway, the main problem, as you know, is you're always in the pancreas when you're trying to get into bile duct. So if you're in there anyway, hey, put a guide wire in there, put a stent in, and then, then you're covered. By the way, I meant to say this is pretty free floating, and uh, you know I, I'm, I'm happy with being interrupted or questions or whatever. Uh, this is another source of uh, litigation around is, is people doing pre-cuts uh, with no training, and they get they get a needle knife out and they go at it, and the next thing they get a retroperitoneal perforation or something. And if you if you haven't done this with at least somebody standing over you, even if it's one of your partners who knows how to do this, it looks awful bad in court because. Uh, there's plenty of literature out that the complication rate of needle knife is about twice regular papillotomy in, in non-expert hands. And you should never, ever, ever just use this for diagnostic access alone. Um, you know, if you think you've got something therapeutic to do, particularly somebody who's got cholangitis or whatever, uh, <clears throat> you really need to get in there. But if you use it frivolously and you get into trouble, it's awful hard for people like me to come and defend you. So this is this little example of needle knifing, uh, probably the best papilla you could imagine for doing this because there's a long intrajudinal segment um, but basically this is cutting up from the orifice. Some people like to do a fistulotomy and cut down. Uh, I tend, try, tend to recommend against that because people tend to push that needle knife in too hard and they bore holes and the bile duct really isn't very far below the surface if you're on the right axis. So. Uh, just, just you need to know the technique and have somebody kind of show you. Uh, my next uh, commandment is that, that I won't place a metal stent across a benign biliary or pancreatic stricture except in the setting of a controlled clinical trial or until we really develop removable stents. I see, I see some of these coming in from the community now based on stuff that's coming out mainly in the European literature and benign strictures. I think the data are still not good enough to support doing that and I realize it's very frustrating if you've got somebody with a stricture that, uh, that isn't responding to serial dilations and stenting. But you know, if you put a particular, if you put an uncovered metal stent, as this is what you end up with. This is looking up the bore of a metal stent, uncovered one, that's epithelialized, so the epithelium has just grown through the interstices, and you have to be pretty handy with a blowtorch to get this baby out, to be honest. And um, the surgeons don't like it. It, it. it creates a lot of difficulties for them when they have to resect these strictures. Um, there's a lot of tearing and stuff goes on when they take these out. So if you're thinking about putting metal stents in benign strictures, again, I, I think that's a job for a tertiary center who's doing it in the setting of looking at it. In some way, the coated metal stents have their own problems too so we're still trying to work this out but um, you know if you I get calls from people too some of my former fellows call up and say I'm in the middle of an ERCP you know they call me up from the middle of Utah or somewhere I'm about to put a you know metal stent in this spin and I said well, I'm glad you phoned and of course the reason they phone is some little voice said you know John Bailey will be really pissed if I do this and he hears about it um, but I say, you know, you're calling me because you're uncomfortable with this right and so well I wasn't quite sure I said well your instinct is very good let's not do this think about what else there is to do. So in the current state of metal stents, I think not really for benign structure. There is another use that's interesting that's out there. Again, I don't think it's for the community. Uh, <clears throat> there's a group of patients with pancreas divisum who um, keep stenosing the orifice of the you do a minor papillotomy on them. They close up and uh, Glenn Lehman's been putting metal stents in, in those people's pancreases to dilate the dorsal duct enough for a surgeon to be able to do a pustotype procedure on it. Um, you know, that's a kind of tour de force, but not something I think anybody in the community wants to be into. This is just a metal stent that, that's occluded here. Um, again, not, not too many people outside uh, referral centers do endoscopic drainage of pseudocyst, but it does come up from time to time. I need to tell you that really, if you're going to do this these days, you should be using endoscopic ultrasound to survey it. You know, doing blind puncture of bulges in the stomach doesn't cut it anymore. Um, if you have uh, a, a misadventure from that, somebody's going to say, well, doesn't the literature say you should be screening the area, you're going to puncture with the US. 
you do have to have a surgeon who's prepared to back you up. And so when we do this at, at tertiary centres, we tell us, we, first of all, it's a multidisciplinary thing. We sit down and look at the case, and half the time when it's sent to us is, can you do an endoscopic? It's not suitable for endoscopic for a variety of reasons. So we sit down and really work out what's in the best interest of the patient. And then we'll say to the surgeon, will you keep space in the OR? You know, if I have a catastrophic hemorrhage, can you get this patient to the, in the OR in 15 minutes? And I won't do them unless I know you can do that. Now, if you ever try and get into an OR on somebody's regular day, and they're in the middle of some other operation, and, you know, it's, there's a lot of time goes by. But when you get bad bleeding with these things, it's usually from a varix or from a, a pseudoaneurysm. And these people, there have been deaths, you know, from this. So you really need a sort of team approach because when it goes well, it goes great. When it goes badly, it happens all of a sudden. Um, I hope none of you would, would attempt to drain this endoscopically for two reasons. One is um, it's probably not a pseudocyst. This is, this is what Peter Banks would call a necroma. There's probably a lot of dead pancreas in here with some fluid around it. All you will achieve is you will infect it. If you're Todd Barron, you know, maybe you can do this in bore holes. I know at DDW you've probably seen his videos of going into caves that look like, you know, stalactites and stalagmites and things hanging down and he's pulling bits of stuff that looks like snot from your nose out of this. And I don't know how he knows he's not pulling out the aorta, the inferior vena cava. But for, for lesser, us lesser mortals, um, this, this is not something that anybody should be getting into. And of course, EUS now, if it's available, if it's in your institution or you have somebody in your group and an increasing number of practices in the community now who, who have at least a partner who does EUS, if you have it available and you don't use it, somebody's going to ask you in that deposition, well, you know, Dr. Smith could have done an EUS for you, couldn't he, and marked the spot. And, and of course, what we're looking for is things like this, and these are varices in the wall of the cyst. Um, so, uh, again, this is a somewhat danger Will Robinson area in practice. I think the way this is going to go is that more and more the EUS people are going to be able to drain these without our help. It never seemed to me to make much sense to be swapping scopes and stuff. But they now larger scopes with therapeutic channels that will take stents and stuff and I'm encouraging us to do these as one one step procedures. Hey John. Yeah. We, um, we don't have the EUS availability here in the state so we're, we're kind of limited. <clears throat> but I, um, I will drain these. I for those ones where you've got stuff in the bottom where clearly there's there's necrosis, I feel uncomfortable. But the thing that make, gives me a comfort zone is the is a needle. You know, the barren needle. Or you're not actually cutting them. The old days where you bore through with a needle knife. Um, <clears throat> I think those days are over. I, I think with those needles, uh, the safety is is up to a point where if there's I think it's yeah, if, if you don't have the VUS available, uh, the algorithm is different than if you know what you're doing. The, what Steve's talking about, in the old days, we used to go and take a needle knife and make a huge hole. You know, it's kind of, how far can we go without getting scared? And of course, the further we cut, the more likely it was we'd hit a vessel or whatever. And so, nowadays, if we go in, we leave a wire through that little puncture site, and then we balloon dilate it and leave a stent in. So, you know, somebody like Steve is very well trained in that, and I wouldn't be at all worried about him doing what he's talking about. But the, temp the temptation these days, and I see a lot of it in our community, is people to dabble. There's a pseudocyst, oh, this sounds like fun, we'll try it. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the, there are techniques you have to know about. So if you're going to do this, you know, you need a little training in it, correct? Yeah, another uh, couple anecdotes I'll, I'll throw out there. There's a uh, <coughs> gastroenterologist in Texas that I knew well. And he was really, really good, and I was presenting a case of a pseudocyst, and he said, boy, back in the old days, in the 80s, because we had a, a new YAG laser, we thought that was really cool, and <coughs> so he'd go down to the stomach, he said he only did it once, basically just looked at the bulge and just started mm -hmm. flaming it with the YAG laser, and he said, next thing you know, there's this gigantic hole of fluids pouring out, he said, he said they never did that again. So back in the old days, they were really uh, pretty wild. But, and there would be, Stomach and then just can't really see very well. The endoscope is a, is a, is a, is a, is a one. 
go. And that was pretty amazing where I was pointing to the area, the surgeon's right there, and I said, that's where you want to go. And then this harmonic scalpel comes through the laparoscope. And that's the same effect, just blows a big hole. No bleeding or anything. And then I just drove my endoscope into the system looked around. So that's an interesting procedure. The problem is you've got to coordinate your time and the, and the surgeons, but it's, it's very effective. And then I really do, I mean, I, I agree, John, the safety issue is major. I had a, a case recently where it looked perfect, but I just wasn't comfortable with the space and I didn't see a good ball. I said, that's it. And I sent him to uh, Dick Kazarek. Dick Kazarek did it <coughs> with the U.S. first and um, Traverso was back up and he had a perforation and the patient went to surgery. But that was done at a tertiary center with a surgeon ready with the U.S. first. And again, that was one where I said, I don't feel comfortable when I said it. And I think if you <coughs> go at it with that approach, uh, you'll steer clear of trouble. I've never had a complication with one of these. I probably should never have said that, but you know, <laughs> next year I'll probably have a disaster. But the, the needle at least prevents the... Well, it's, mu it's much easier for me to cause a complication and get away with it than it is for somebody in the community. You know, at tertiary center, we... we, we probably have a bit more time to do some things, we get more help around, we, you know, uh, we have better backup and stuff. And I would say if, if there's one unifying thing that comes out of the issue about litigation in this area, uh, I mean ERCP and those things, is, is consent. Uh, and I can come and defend most of you if you've consented to patients and given them some feel for it, but the number of times the patients say, the nurse handed me the sheet, I signed it, you know, I didn't see him before the procedure, he never came and saw me after it. So consent, if you, if you actually get down to the consent, it might al allow you to stop long enough to think this is maybe something I shouldn't do. And I think uh, I commend Steve if he had the, had, if he was nervous about doing a case to send it to somebody like Dick Kazarek. But Dick would say the same, I probably caused more complications than anybody in this room. Well, yeah, uh, that's a good question, and we we could certainly spend all morning talking about about consent issues. It's one of my hobby horses, but um, and I don't know how many of you do it, but it's awful good to have somebody standing by. We usually at least try and get a family member and and co-sign the consent form, if not a nurse, because it does become he said, she said, and particularly after Ver said, they don't remember what planet they were on. But it's, you know, that it's your best defense in any lawsuit is it properly executed informed consent. I, I was an expert for actually a plaintiff one time in a suit that was egregious, I thought. I mean, I, I didn't expect that the, the guy that had caused the complication could get away with it. And I didn't, I, I was amazed it came to trial. And it all hinged around the fact that this lady had, in, had signed the consent form and it did say on it that she could have X, Y, and Z and the jury were persuaded that, you know, even though the guy was a buffoon and attempting something he shouldn't have been doing that she had signed and said it was okay for him to do it. So it may even save you from yourself, but if you don't have informed consent, you know, if I get charts to look at and there's no notes, it's horrible. You know, if I can't follow a timeline and it's a typical thing as somebody comes in, they get pain after the procedure, they're admitted, they're not seen again until maybe 24 hours later or you know, there's communication gaps, the nurses are doing things, taking phone orders, but there's no timeline, there's no indication of what the thought process was in it. You know, at what point did somebody realize there was a perforation here? At what point did somebody realize this patient was getting severe pancreatitis? That's what's hard to defend. I can defend it if I can work through your thought process, because most people are not trying to get themselves sued, and most people are trying to do their best, but the lawyers just love it if there's no documentation. So document, 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 you know. By the way, don't, don't use the word sphincter of audio dysfunction unless you really are going to do something about it, manometry. If you're going to do an ELCP, even if sphincter of audio dysfunction occurs to you, don't put those words in there if you're not going to manner them, because that will get you hung in your court case. Put, I was going looking for a stone or something, blip in the LFT. Don't mention SOD, because the lawyers love that. I shall not perform routine pre lap coli ELCP to define ductal anatomy or to look for stones that are unlikely to be present. 
I was an expert in a, a case up in Virginia about five years ago where a gastroenterologist and a surgeon had a nice deal that the GI guy would do ELCPs on every case before lap coli. There was this old lady who had had an episode of gallstone pancreatitis, got over it. Somehow there was like a three month gap between when she had the episode and when she finally came to lap coli. She was set up the day before for a routine ELCP to check her ducts. The guy had trouble getting in, he left his way in, got into a bar that put some dye in, didn't see anything that mold it. She was admitted with some orders. The first time the surgeon saw her was the next morning on the table, draped and ready for the procedure. He didn't really talk to her, the consent had been done somewhere along the line. So he goes in there, finds a lot of fluid and stuff, and looks at the note from the GI guy, decides the GI guy must have perforated her doing the needle knife, so decides to open her to look for the perforations. So, you know, when you do that, they do something they call cockerizing the duodenum. They, they release the duodenal sweep from its peritoneal attachments, and they, they flop it over, and then they go dig in there. It's quite an invasive procedure. I didn't really occur to him until he couldn't find the perf that what this lady had was terrible pancreatitis. He was, you know, he found some fat necrosis and eventually put two and two together. Now, if you open somebody in the middle of evolving severe pancreatitis, you just about killed them. I mean, that's a high mortality. That's 50% mortality. Those people don't recover. Anyway, she died. I couldn't, nobody could defend that. You know, this woman had no indication for a pre-operative ELCP. Now, the American College of Surgeons says there is no indication LCP to define ductal anatomy. So if a surgeon says to check any aberrant ducts in here, it's been well shown that just showing that there's a, 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 an aberrant right posterior sectoral duct will not prevent you transecting it. So that's not an indication. They can get that information from an MRCP or whatever. And if you don't have the surrogate markers for a stone like a dilated duct abnormal LFTs, the chances you're going to find one are less than 5%. And then you get surgeons that say, well, I don't do IOC. Well, if he doesn't or she doesn't do IOC, they shouldn't be doing lap coli because the American College of Surgeons says it's part of the skill set required to do lap coli to be able to do IOCs. Now, there are obviously situations that demand preoperative uh, ERCP. If there's signs of, of a stone there or uh, something that suggests of a dilated duct that there may have been a stone and it's a patient with a B2 or stenosis down there and there's some concern about whether you can get to afterwards, it's not unreasonable for the surgeon to ask you to do it before. But most of the time if there's an issue, we just say, you do your lap coli, do you, do you do your IOC, and if there's a problem, we'll do a next day ELCP. And I almost never get a phone call the next day because there's nothing to find. There is a little cottage industry now and people being sent people who have IOCs that don't drain into duodenum. And I never find anything in these people, and I think it's because they go down and they manipulate and they put probes into the bile duct and they cause edema. And then when they put the dye in, it doesn't want to run through. But don't do routine stuff for surgeons, because they, they won't come and defend you in court. You know, Dr. Schutz had told me this wasn't standard of care, I would never have asked them to do it. You know, when these things come to court, your buddies run the other direction, people you think were your friends. Will not, you know, the, the the lawyer will say, you know, we're we're, we're defending you, we're not defending Dr. Schutz. So has to be ever vigilant for his enemy, the cat next door. So. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if it would be better with the lights down again, because most of these are show and tell. I'm going to show. It's up to you, uh, but uh, you might see these things better. The other thing that uh, Steve might remember is my my passion for flying, and uh, that's why the flying videos come up. This is actually taken over Beaufort Airport uh, down at the coast of North Carolina, one of my favorite places to fly in, in the summertime. So why am I showing uh, the Ten Commandments here? Uh, when, I, when I talked to Steve, uh, he said, you know, you can talk about anything you want to, really, and you can decide how you want to do this. So I'm going to diverge in a major way from the program, because uh, I thought you didn't really need a, a 40 minutes or whatever in ELCP training and those kind of things. and so. I've got a couple, actually I've got three little little talks of which we can do two or three depending on how the time goes, we'll take breaks and stuff. But I think they're on, on very clinically relevant things to you guys. First thing I was going to talk about was a talk I give, uh, which I call Dr. Bailey's Ten Commandments of VLCP or Billary Pancreatic. And, um, so we're not going to be talking about, about Charlton Heston and, and the Biblical Ten Commandments alone. No, nobody did it better 
uh, than old uh, Charlton. And as you know, in, in his latter days, he was known as, as Guns and Moses, right? when he was with the NRA. <clears throat> Uh, we're not going to talk about Justice uh, Roy Moore either. You remember he got into a bit of excitement uh, when he had this thing in his court that eventually got taken away the Ten Commandments and a block of granite in the front of his courthouse. And the, the civil liberties people said this was, uh, this was a bit of extra pressure we didn't need, so they took that away. I'm not going to talk about the Ten Commandments Bible board game, which I'm sure most of us have at home. I do like these Ten Commandments. These are Ten Commandments for people in New York, and this includes silence thy cell phone whilst in the theater, for God's sake, was thou sired in New Jersey, <laughs> and speak not thy bomb joke while in the security line. So I'm not going to cover any of those ones. Um, I'm going to try not to tell you any lies either. As you can see, I've kind of got into this video thing. And but people often ask me uh, to talk about do's and don'ts. And there's a lot of stuff in, in the literature right now about medical legal stuff. Those of you who got this month's gastrointestinal endoscopy, there's a kind of fluffy piece by Peter Cotton on looking at 59 cases that he was an expert witness in, um, in medical legal stuff for cases that were bad outcomes of ERCP. And there's some accompanying little editorials on it. And, so there's a lot of buzz about do's and don'ts. So as a lot of this is very anecdotal, I thought, well, why not, why not share my own prejudices? So the, these are so, somewhat tongue-in-cheek and certainly not intended to, to poke any fun at any religious thing, but I've, I've styled them in the forms of commandments. So my number one commandment, <clears throat> and they're not necessarily in order of importance, but is that I shall not undertake ERCP in any patient, especially a woman, with normal amylase, lipase, LFTs, a normal bile duct diameter, with the intention of diagnosing post-call cystectomy, right hypochondrial or epigastric pain, unless I can do manometry. If you want to get yourself sued doing ELCP, do these patients. Now, young women with right upper quadrant pain and nothing else should have a big flashing sign, Danger Will Robinson, when they come into your <laughs> office. Seriously, they're a danger to your practice because They'll, they'll beg, borrow, steal, whatever to get an ERCP and then when you give them terrible post ERCP pancreatitis they will successfully sue you because there's enough people out there writing that you shouldn't do these patients without, unless in the context of manometry that, that if you're not talking sphincter dysfunction not send them to a tertiary centre, you're toast. So, you know, we could talk about this and you'll be delighted to know I'm not going to really uh, if you want to know my opinions about sphincter dysfunction, I, I wrote an editorial that I took some heat for in the Red Journal three or four months ago, uh, really questioning what the heck we're doing with this. You know, type 1 <coughs> SOD is a real disease, it's, but it's, it isn't really SOD, it's papillary stenosis. Type 2, I see a few of, they're all type 3s, they're all people with pain and nothing else. And we really need to reclassify this, but until we can do it better, if you're going to call these people type 3, they need to have a manometry proving that they have sphincter dysfunction. So I would say that those patients you should not, you know, if the issue comes up, is this sphincter of body dysfunction, I don't know where you send you, I know you send some stuff to Dick Kazarek and stuff, but if you want to protect yourself, don't do it. Unless you're somebody who's done a lot of ERCP, you've got into practice, you've got set up, you're, you're, you're setting yourself up to be a, a local expert, don't do it. You know, if I had a dollar for every time I've looked at a medical legal case and heard in a deposition a gastroenterologist said, I wish I'd never met this patient, I wish I'd never thought of ERCP, I'd be rich. So my second command is, I shall not perform biliary sphincterotomy for presumed or proven sphincter OD dysfunction without at least putting a pancreatic stent in. And um, this, this has become a kind of big area and it's important for you to know about medical legally because... There are a number of papers now in the literature that show very convincingly that if you stent the pancreatic duct in a situation where there's significant risk of pancreatitis after your manipulations, that you can at least avoid the worst end of the spectrum of post ERCP pancreatitis, i.e. necrotizing pancreatitis. It may not avoid them having a night of pain and needing admitted, but they won't get terrible pancreatic necrosis. And the size of the stents has gone down and down and down. This is the sort of latest iteration, which is the single pigtail three French stent that has to go over a pretty skinny little wire. 
an 018 and these are designed to fall out in a day or two and they almost all do and uh, there's enough of that the lawyers all know this now and, you know the people that know the literature it's not me it's not you it's the lawyers because they send their nurses that they, 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 they hire to help them with their cases to go and trawl the literature and they and they also go to websites and if you go to the website for example on ERCP and Lap Coley you'll get about 10 things that are all law offices telling you how to sue people who've had a bad outcome of ERCP. The lawyers research this and they share the information about it. And just like you come here for this course, they go places for a weekend to learn how to successfully sue Dr. Schutz for his post ESP pancreatitis. It's down to that level. I mean, they look at all the cases, what the successful ploys have been to get the jury convinced this was malpractice. They know the literature now. They know and I can't, I can't defend you if you don't, you know, if you're in a risky situation and you haven't at least thought of stenting the pancreatic duct and they get a terrible outcome. It's very hard to defend you because that literature's out there. So I would say if you're going to be somebody doing any amount of ERCP, and particularly in patients who uh, are risky, and about the only non-risky ones are old ladies with big stones, you should think about putting a stent in the pancreatic duct. I've never really regretted doing it, but I've read it, regretted plenty not doing it. The one time it's a little difficult is if there's a loop-de-loop -loop with so-called ANSA or a you know, sharp turn-off of the pancreatic duct. Sometimes the guide wire will not go around the corner. But uh, you should at least think about doing that. Are any of you doing putting in pancreatic stents? Or do you? I, think it's, uh, I think it's a good thing to do. This is a, an older slide, and I would use a smaller stent than this, but this is a patient but I had to needle knife to get into the bile duct and uh, one, one good way to get into the bile duct if you can't get in is if, if you're in the pancreatic duct anyway put a stent in there and then just cut up over it or if, if you have your papillotome you know because you've got one hole filled there's only one other place for it to go and often once you have the stent in there the, the papillotome or, or your cannula will go straight into the bile duct but if you've done that then I leave the stent in there this happens to be a flanged uh, five French stent but I will leave a stent in there. It only has to stay in a day or so. And the thought is that what causes the pancreatitis is edema closing off the, the pancreatic orifice. So, so be liberal with using these. I hear a lot of people say, well, I don't want to be a pancreatic endotherapist. That was one of the topics that Steve gave me to talk about, you know, pancreatic endotherapy. Unfortunately, now, if you're going to be an ERCP person, you've got to be a pancreatic endotherapist. And anyway, the main problem, as you know, is you're always in the pancreas when you're trying to get into bile duct. So if you're in there anyway, hey, put a guide wire in there, put a stent in, and then, then you're covered. By the way, I meant to say, this is pretty free-floating, and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy with being interrupted or questions or whatever. Uh, this is another source of uh, litigation, or is, is people doing pre-cuts uh, with no training, and they get, they get a needle knife out, and they go at it, and the next thing they get a retroperitoneal perforation or something. And if you... If you haven't done this with at least somebody standing over you, even if it's one of your partners who knows how to do this, it looks awful bad in court because uh, there's plenty of literature out that the complication rate of needle knife is about twice regular papillotomy in, in non-expert hands. And you should never, ever, ever just use this for diagnostic access alone. Um, you know, if you think you've got something therapeutic to do, particularly somebody who's got cholangitis or whatever, uh, <coughs> you really need to get in there. But if you use it frivolously and you get into trouble, it's awful hard for people like me to come and defend you. So this is this little example of needle knifing, uh, probably the best papilla you could imagine in for doing this because there's a long intrajudinal segment. Um, but basically this is cutting up from the orifice. Some people like to do a fistulotomy and cut down. Uh, I tend, try, tend to recommend against that because people tend to push that needle knife in too hard and they bore holes. And the bile duct really isn't very far below the surface if you're on the right axis. So uh, just, just you need to know the technique and have somebody kind of show you. Uh, my next uh, commandment is that I won't place a metal stent across a benign biliary or pancreatic stricture except in the setting of a controlled clinical trial or until we really develop removable stents. I see, I see some of these coming in from the community now based on stuff that's coming out mainly in the European literature and benign strictures. I think the data are still not good enough to support doing that. And I realize it's very frustrating if you've got somebody with a stricture that uh, 
that isn't responding to serial dilations and stenting. But, you know, if you put a particular, if you put an uncovered metal stent, is this is what you end up with. This is looking up the bore of a metal stent, uncovered one, that's epithelialized, so the epithelium has just grown through the interstices. And you have to be pretty handy with a blowtorch to get this baby out, to be honest. And um, the surgeons don't like it. It, it. it creates a lot of difficulties for them when they have to resect these strictures. Um, there's a lot of tearing and stuff goes on when they take these out. So if you're thinking about putting metal stents in benign strictures, again, I, I think that's a job for a tertiary center who's doing it in the setting of looking at it in some way. The coated metal stents have their own problems too. So we're still trying to work this out. But um, you know, if you, I get calls from people too. Some of my former fellows call up and say, I'm in the middle of an ERCP. You know, they call me up from the middle of Utah or somewhere. I'm about to put a, you know, a metal stent in this benign and I said, well, I'm glad you phoned. And of course, the reason they phoned is some little voice said, you know, John Bailey will be really pissed if I do this and he hears about it. Um, but I said, you know, you're calling me because you're uncomfortable with this, right? And he said, well, I wasn't quite sure. I said, well, your instinct is very good. Let's not do this. Think about what else there is to do. So in the current state of metal stents, I think not really for benign structure. There is another use that's interesting that's out there. But again, I don't think it's for the community. Uh, <clears throat> there's a group of patients with pancreas divisum who um, keep stenosing the orifice of the, you do a minor papillotomy on them, they close up, and uh, Glenn Lehman's been putting metal stents in, in those people's pancreases to dilate the dorsal duct enough for a surgeon to be able to do a pustotype procedure on it. Um, you know, that's a kind of tour de force, but not something I think anybody in the community wants to be into. This is just a metal stent that, that's occluded here. Um, again, not, not too many people outside uh, referral centers do endoscopic drainage of pseudocysts, but it does come up from time to time. I need to tell you that really, if you're going to do this these days, you should be using endoscopic ultrasound to survey it. You know, doing blind puncture of bulges in the stomach doesn't cut it anymore. Um, if you have uh, a, a misadventure from that, somebody's going to say, well, doesn't the literature say you should be screening the area, you're going to puncture with the US. You do have to have a surgeon who's prepared to back you up. And so when we do this at, at tertiary centers, we tell us, we, first of all, it's a multidisciplinary thing. We sit down and look at the case, and half the time when it's sent to us is, can you do an endoscopic? It's not suitable for endoscopic for a variety of reasons. So we sit down and really work out what's in the best interest of the patient. And then we'll say to the surgeon, will you keep space in the OR? You know, if I have a catastrophic hemorrhage, can you get this patient to the, in the OR in 15 minutes? And I won't do them unless I know you can do that. Now, if you ever try and get into an OR on somebody's regular day, and you're in the middle of some other operation, and, you know, it's, there's a lot of time goes by. But when you get bad bleeding with these things, it's usually from a varix or from a, a pseudoaneurysm. And these people, there have been deaths, you know, from this. So you really need a sort of team approach because when it goes well, it goes great. When it goes badly, it happens all of a sudden. Um, I hope none of you would, would attempt to drain this endoscopically for two reasons. One is um, it's probably not a pseudocyst. This is, this is what Peter Banks would call a necroma. There's probably a lot of dead pancreas in here with some fluid around it. All you will achieve is you will infect it. If you're Todd Barron, you know, maybe you can do this and bore holes. I know at DDW, you've probably seen his videos of going into caves that look like, you know, stalactites and stalagmites and things hanging down, and he's pulling bits of stuff that looks like snot from your nose out of this. And I don't know how he knows he's not pulling out the orta, the inferior vena cava. But for, for lesser, us lesser mortals, um, this, this is not something that anybody should be getting into. And of course, EUS now, if it's available, if it's in your institution or you have somebody in your group, and there are an increasing number of practices in the community now who, who have at least a partner does EUS, if you have it available and you don't use it, somebody's going to ask you in that deposition, well, you know, Dr. Smith could have done an EUS for you, couldn't he, and marked the spot. And of course, what we're looking for is things like this, and these are varices in the wall of the cyst. Um, so uh, again, this is a somewhat danger Will Robinson area in practice. I think the way this is going to go is that more and more the EUS people are going to be able to drain these without our help. It never seemed to me to make much sense to be swapping scopes and stuff. They now 
larger scopes with therapeutic channels that will take stents and stuff, and I'm encouraging ours to do these as one one step procedures. Hey John. Yeah. We um, we don't have a US app availability here in the States, so we're we're kind of limited. <coughs> but I um, I will drain these. I for those ones where you've got stuff in the bottom where clearly there's there's a process I feel uncomfortable. But the thing that makes gives me a comfort zone is the is a needle, you know, the barren needle for you're not actually cutting them. In the old days where you bore through with a needle knife, um, <coughs> I think those days are over. I, I think with those needles, uh, the safety is, is up to a point where if there's less available, I, I think it's probably pretty reasonable. Yeah, if, if you don't have EUS available, uh, the algorithm is different than if you know what you're doing. The, what Steve's talking about, in the old days, we used to go and take a needle knife and make a huge hole, you know, it's kind of how far can we go without getting scared? And of course, the further we cut, the more likely it was we'd hit a vessel or whatever. And so nowadays, if we go in, we leave a wire through that little puncture site, and then we balloon dilate it and leave a stent in. So, you know, somebody like Steve is very well trained in that, and I wouldn't be at all worried about him doing what he's talking about. But the, temp the temptation these days, and I see a lot of it in our community, is people to dabble. Because I see this, is, oh, this sounds like fun, we'll try it. Uh, and, and you know the, the, there are techniques you have to know about. So if you're going to do this, you know you need a little training in it, correct? Yeah. Another uh, couple anecdotes I'll, I'll throw out there is a, uh, a gastroenterologist in Texas that I knew well. And he was really, really good. And I was presenting a case of a pseudocyst, and he said, "Boy, back in the old days, in the '80s, because we had a new YAG laser, we thought that was really cool." And so he'd go down to the stomach. He said he only did it once. Basically, just look at the bulge and just sort of flame it with the YAG laser. It's the next thing you know, there's this gigantic hole of fluids pouring out. He said, he said, they never did that again. So back in the old days, they were really uh, pretty wild. And Eric Lippy, who trained with, with me, the John and a partner uh, in Boston, wrote a paper where they described endoscopic and laparoscopic pseudos so strange. I thought that was very interesting. I've actually done one that works, works very well. The endoscope is the eyes for the laparoscope. The laparoscope goes into the stomach and then you just can't really see very well. The endoscope is the where you want to go. And that was pretty amazing where I was pointing to the area, the surgeon's right there, and I said, that's where you want to go. And then this harmonic scalpel comes through the laparoscope. And has the same effect, just blows a big hole. No bleeding or anything. And then I just drove my endoscope into the system looked around. So, that's an interesting procedure. The problem is you've got to coordinate your time and the, and the surgeons, but it's it's very effective. And then I really do, I mean, I, I agree, John, the safety issue is major. I had a, a case recently where it looked perfect, but I just wasn't comfortable with the space and I didn't see a good bulge. I said, that's it. And I sent him to uh, Dick Kazarek. Dick Kazarek did it <coughs> with the U.S. first and um, Traverso as backup and he had a perforation and the patient went to surgery. But that was done at a tertiary center with a surgeon ready with the US first. And again, that was one where I said, I don't feel comfortable when I said it. And I think if you <coughs> go ahead with that approach, uh, you'll steer clear of trouble. I've never had a complication with one of these. I probably should never have said that, but you know, <laughs> next year I'll probably have a disaster. But the, the needle at least prevents the it's much, it's much easier for me to cause a complication and get away with it than it is for somebody in the community. You know, at tertiary centre, we, we we probably have a bit more time to do some things. We get more help around. We, you know, uh, we have better backup and stuff. And I would say if, if there's one unifying thing that comes out of the issue about litigation in this area, uh, I mean, ERCP and those things is, is consent. Uh, and I can come and defend most of you if you've consented to patients and given them some feel for it, but the number of times the patients say, the nurse handed me the sheet, I signed it, you know, I didn't see him before the procedure, never came and saw me after it. So consent, if you, if you actually get down to the consent, it might al allow you to stop long enough to think this is maybe something I shouldn't do. And I think uh, I commend Steve if he had the... Had, if he was nervous about doing a case to send it to somebody like Dick Kazarek. But Dick would say the same. I probably caused more complications than anybody in this room. We have a pre litigation thing, and I was saying more and more the patient could not remember having consent. And I know the gastroenterologist still didn't consent, but with the sedation, 
they just could not remember. Um, is this something that we should be giving to people? <laughs> Well, uh, that's a good question, and we, we could certainly spend all morning talking about, about consent issues. It's one of my hobby horses, but um, and I don't know how many of you do it, but it's awful good to have somebody standing by. We usually at least try and get a family member in and co-sign the consent form, if not a nurse, because it does become he said, she said, and particularly after Ver said, they don't remember what planet they were on. But it's, you know, that it's your best defense in any lawsuit is it properly executed informed consent. I, I was an expert for actually a plaintiff one time in a suit that was egregious, I thought. I mean, I, I didn't expect that the, the guy that had caused the complication could get away with it. And I, didn't, I, I was amazed it came to trial. And it all hinged around the fact that this lady had, ins had signed the consent form and it did say on it that she could have X, Y, and Z and the jury were persuaded that, you know, even though the guy was a buffoon and attempting something he shouldn't have been doing that she had signed and said it was okay for him to do it. So it may even save you from yourself. But if you don't have informed consent, you know, if I get charts to look at and there's no notes, it's horrible. You know, if I can't follow a timeline and it's a typical thing as somebody comes in, they get pain after the procedure, they're admitted, they're not seen again until maybe 24 hours later or... You know, there's communication gaps, the nurses are doing things, taking phone orders, but there's no timeline, there's no indication of what the thought process was in it. You know, at what point did somebody realize there was a perforation here? At what point did somebody realize this patient was getting severe pancreatitis? That's what's hard to defend. I can defend it if I can work through your thought process, because most people are not trying to get themselves sued, and most people are trying to do their best, but the lawyers just love it if there's no documentation. So document, 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 you know. By the way, don't, don't use the word sphincter of body dysfunction unless you really are going to do something about it, manometry. If you're going to do an ELCP, even if sphincter of body dysfunction occurs to you, don't put those words in there if you're not going to manner them, because that'll get you hung in your court case. Put, I was going looking for a stone or something, blip in the LFD. Don't mention SOD, because the lawyers love that. I shall not perform routine pre lap coli ELCP to define ductal anatomy or to look for stones that are unlikely to be present. <clears throat> I was an expert in a, a case up in Virginia about five years ago where a gastroenterologist and a surgeon had a nice deal that the GI guy would do ELCPs on every case before lap coli. There was this old lady who had an episode of gallstone pancreatitis, got over it, Somehow there was like a three-month gap between when she had the episode and when she finally came to lap coat. She was set up the day before for a routine ELCP to check her ducts. The guy had trouble getting in. He lifted his way in, got into a that put some dye in. Didn't see anything that was moldy. She was admitted with some orders. The first time the surgeon saw her was the next morning on the table, draped and ready for the procedure. He didn't really talk to her. The consent had been done somewhere along the line. So he goes in there, finds a lot of fluid and stuff, and looks at the note from the GI guy, decides the GI guy must have perforated her doing the needle knife, so decides to open her to look for the perforations. So, you know, when you do that, they do something they call cockerizing the duodenum. They, they release the duodenal sweep from its peritoneal attachments and they, they flop it over and then they go dig in there. It's quite an invasive procedure. I didn't really occur to him until he couldn't find the perf that what this lady had was terrible pancreatitis. He was, you know, he found some fat necrosis and eventually put two and two together. Now if you open somebody in the middle of evolving severe pancreatitis, you just about killed them. I mean that's a high mortality. That's 50% mortality. Those people don't recover. Anyway, she died. I couldn't, nobody could defend that. You know, this woman had no indication for a pre-operative ELCP. Now, the American College of Surgeons says there is no indication for ELCP to define ductal anatomy. So if a surgeon says to check any aberrant ducts in here, it's been well shown that just showing that there's a, 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 an aberrant right posterior sectoral duct will not prevent you transecting it. So that's not an indication. They can get that information from an MRCP or whatever. And if you don't have the surrogate markers for a stone like a dilated duct abnormal LFTs, the chances you're going to find one are less than 5%. And then you get surgeons that say, well, I don't do IOC. Well, if he doesn't or she doesn't do IOC, they shouldn't be doing lap coli because the American College of Surgeons says it's part of the skill set required 
to do lap coli to be able to do IOCs. Now there are obviously situations that demand pre-operative uh, ERCP if the signs is of, of a stone there or uh, something that suggests of a dilated duct that there may have been a stone and it's a patient with a B2 or a stenosis down there and there's some concern about whether you can get to it afterwards it's not unreasonable for the surgeon to ask you to do it before but most of the time if there's an issue we just say you do your lap coli, do you, do, you do your IOC and if there's a problem we'll do a next day ERCP and I almost never get a phone call the next day because there's nothing to find there is a little cottage industry now and people being sent people who have IOCs that don't drain into duodenum and I never find anything in these people and I think it's because they go down and they manipulate and they put probes into the bile duct and they cause edema and then we put the dye and it doesn't want to run through but don't do routine stuff for surgeons because they, they won't come and defend you in court you know Dr. Schutz had told me this wasn't standard of care I would never have asked them to do it you know, when these things come to court, your buddies run the other direction. People you think were your friends will not, you know, the, the, the lawyer will say, you know, we're, we're, we're defending you, we're not defending Dr. Schutz. So just uh, look out for yourselves. <clears throat> and particularly one with such great imaging these days, this is a, uh, it's not even a current generation MRI, but this is actually showing a nice little hyalur cholangiocarcinoma. Look at the quality, I can't do any better than that with an ERCP. Uh, that's... Uh, uh, you know, uh, sclerosing cholangitis kind of patient, but I could get the same information with ERCP without injecting dye under pressure and putting them at risk of, of uh, cholangitis. So there are situations now where you, there are other ways of getting this information without, you know, without ERCP. This is a particular hobby horse of mine because we regularly get a call from out in the boonies from some anxious surgeon saying, you know, this lady came back three, three days after lap coli, she's got pain, a bit of fever, LFTs are up. I think she must have a leak. Uh, can I get her down there this afternoon for an ERCP? The first question I ask is, what does the CT show? Almost always they haven't done one. And I say, that is the priority. You know, the priority is not to get them in an ambulance and come three hours from the mountains down to wake to have an ERCP. The priority is to know if this patient has two liters of fluid under the liver capsule or wherever. Um, because sometimes by the time those patients get sent from there to your referral centre, they're sick as a dog. We've had patients arrive in the middle of the night dying of sepsis. And if you control that biloma, if they have a biloma and you put a drain into it, you have a controlled fistula. Okay? I mean, it, it, if it goes beyond that, if it's a biloma that becomes free peritoneal fluid, then you're going to get peritonitis because bile is extremely irritant. And those people go off very quickly but you know about it but these people are kind of, kind of look a lot better than they are and they may have that I've seen things like that, that's a biloma and that's probably 5 litres in there, now it's sort of contained at the moment, when that gets out in the peritoneum and within hours they'll have a rigid abdomen they'll have peritonitis so that's the first thing you should do if a surgeon says to you I'm working up a bile what does the cross sectional imaging show is there a big biloma, if there is numero uno thing to do is to put a drain into it. Then you can start thinking about the ERCP. The other thing people do all the time with leaks is send people for HIDA scans. Don't do that. Waste of time. Um, I mean, it may show extravasation and stuff, but you pretty well know these people are leaking. It's not subtle. You know, they're so they got funny numbers and stuff. It, it, you, a lot of the time it doesn't tell you anything. It's a time waster. Uh, another hobby horse of mine, and I wrote an editorial about this once in the Red Journal, I will decline request to perform ERCP for the purpose of stenting any patient cross section imaging shows a liver full of tumour and no ability ductal dilatation, this being an exercise in futility. Usually the patient is the mother of a trustee, if it's in an academic centre, or you know, the mother of the lawyer in town, the Billy Rubin's 20, uh, somebody's done an ultrasound and seen one tiny peripheral dilated duct. Oh, Dr. Schutz, can you please come and put a stent in? <laughs> Dr. Schutz is not going not to be able to help this patient with a stent. I see this still. I mean, I, even though I write about it and talk about it, I must see one of these a month or so sent to me. And it's, there's always huge pressure from the family, you know. Let's get into that ELCP expert and, you know, save grandma. Well, you know, when that patient dies and goes to autopsy, this is what they have. No stent in the world. This is a head of pancreas tumor with medicine. No stent in the world is going to help this patient. In fact, if you stent these patients, and you've all seen things like this, you know, you get 
a CT and it shows a couple of dilated left intrahepatic ducts and then people start to, oh, well, let's PTC them. Don't do it. Can't help them, they'll get worse. And then they'll have the pain from the percutaneous drain and they'll leak or they'll bleed and you'll, you'll just regret you did it. And you just have to say to them, you know, I can't help this, I, I can only make things worse here. And what's the worst thing they can do? They can go somewhere else. Well, that's good for you, you know. I don't lose any sleep at night by saying to people, I can't help your mum, I'm sorry, but this is the situation. I explain why. But these people go to extraordinary lengths. I had one guy who came who was full of tumour and he was only in his 40s and he owned one of these uh, like North Face or, you know, mountain gear shops, you know. He was he's a guy that, you know, climbed every mountain in the world and he was the fittest guy you've ever seen. And this poor guy presents with metastatic pancreatic cancer and he was bouncing off the walls going places and eventually I got a postcard from Japan. He's in Japan having this new experimental chemotherapy. So I was interested enough to get in touch with his wife and say, what's he having? He was getting 5-FU and, you know, something they could have got down the road, you know, and spending all his money doing this. So these people are obviously desperate. I can't help this either. This doesn't project very well, but here's a patient with a solitary lesion in the liver. It turned out to be a little hepatoma. But your people ask you to do an ERCP for that, you know, and you say, well, how am I going to help you? Well, we may see, you know, the ducts splayed around the tumour. Uh, you give this patient terrible pancreatitis, I can't come and defend you for doing that. I mean, it's just, that's just nonsense. That's some surgeon or some oncologist's fantasy. So you don't have to live other people's fantasies for them, correct? They're the, they're the very people that will turn against you and say, you know, if, if Dr. Smith had just told me this was a high-risk, low-yield procedure, I would have you know, not done it. But he said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. You know, we're at the golf club over a gin and tonic. Yeah, I'll get them on my list Monday morning, I'll do it. Can't help that one. We're almost at the end of the commandments. I shall never, know, I, this should probably say knowingly rather than intentionally, but inject contrast above an obstruction in the bowel that without leaving a stent or a nasability drain, or if you can't get an endoscopically arranging for a surgeon or a radiologist to decompress them. So, you know, this is, still happens that people who dabble in this go out, they, they put some dye in the call up and say, I've got this patient. We got a stricture, Dr. Bailey, and I say, well, <clears throat> we'll get them down. What, what, what kind of stent did you leave in? I didn't leave a stent in. I don't stent. And then I say, well, you shouldn't be doing the RCP. I've pissed a few people in our community off by telling them they shouldn't be doing the RCP because I have no time for people who do diagnostic only ERCP. If you, if you go into somebody who's yellow, you know you're going to be doing something therapeutic, right? Uh, if a big dilated duct, it's not fair to do that to a patient and leave them with dye in there because... Two things can happen. One is if you put enough pressure in there, you'll exceed what they call a, the, the bilirubinous gradient here, which is about 40 millimeters of mercury. You'll, you'll force bacteria into the circulation. You'll give them bacteremia or septicemia. And secondly, if you just leave contrast sitting there for a day or two, if there's delay in getting them drained, they will get cholangitis. So if you're in here, if you're going to do the RCP, you should at least be able to put a wire in and leave a, a drain, uh, an isability drain, or a stent, or something. If you can't do that, don't be doing ELCP. And this is the kind of setting where this actually is somebody who's having a PTC, but you know, you put all this dye in there and then not, not drain it. Uh, you're just asking for that patient to get deathly sick. Number 10, I will never tell a patient, never. I, I want to make everybody in this room recite this, but I will never tell a patient that ELCP is very safe or that complications only happen to Dr. Shoot. I'll be honest about the risks, even if it scares patients. And ERCP is the most dangerous procedure that we routinely perform, and, and patients really must be informed of the risks. And I probably spend 15 minutes of my informed consent when I do ERCP on, on many of my patients, uh, because, um, you know, if it only happens to other guys and then it happens to you, the lawyers will love it. So. A lot of people are getting out in the community, are getting out of doing ERCP, partly because of the, it's not doesn't make very much money. Um, in fact, I continually get told that I don't make any money from my institution because you know I use more than one catheter, a guide wire, and it's a Medicare patient. I've used up all the money. Um, the risk is much higher. If you get a long one, you could have done four colons in the time it takes to do one. So. You know, I think uh, the people who've trained in it like to do it, like keep their hand in, that's great. 
um, but more and more because it's becoming such a therapeutic specialty now uh, it's, it's come into the referral centers and, and to touch on the issue about training now you know that the bar is going to get a little higher in training because of the pancreatic stenting stuff because of 90% uh, of what we see now needs a therapeutic procedure I mean, in Steve's days we probably didn't do a whole lot of needle knives did we? We're doing a lot more needle knives now because we're getting complex therapeutic strictures and things to get into so, so that was a little parade of my personal prejudices um, this is, so these are, uh, I just I hope I didn't make you feel that way uh, I've got, I've got, if anybody needs references I've got some at the end there but uh, that's that for now, so I don't know if you want to take a break just now, Steve, or what you'd like to do, but that's... Uh, any any questions from that one? Or I'll be happy to answer any. Who is? You alluded to someone named Will Robinson. I'm not a friend. <laughs> Danger, Will Robinson. Well, you're, you're too young to remember Lost in Space. You remember the robot? Lost in Space? I remember. Well, I have heard of it. <laughs> so I remember, Rob, you know, the, was it Robbie the robot? Yeah, somebody will have to help me here. That was an American thing, but... Danger, Will Robinson. <laughs> he made me do that. He just wanted to see me do my robot. Get that little thing on the side of your head. Yeah, that's right. The diddly, 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 yeah. What about those of us who are not steam shoots but, but do do stents, feel comfortable about sure. that? And, you know, we see a whole lot of color over the glasses. We do. Yeah. Um, the surgeons don't like to um, do come bioduct explorations during laparoscopic cholecystectomy because it takes a whole long time and they may be unsuccessful more often than we are. I mean, do we, do we run a risk because we're not absolute total experts at any endoscopic therapeutic maneuver? No, I think most of the stone work is done in the community now. I mean, there are lots of well-trained, competent people out there doing sphincterotomies and pulling stones out, and that's fine. The issue I think I was raising is that, you know, and, and the other comment you're making is right, although there is a technique of laparoscopic bile duct exploration, very few surgeons want to do it. It takes time. Uh, you have to have a colidocoscope. And if they have somebody they trust doing the LCP, it's quicker and cleaner for them to do it that way. The people that are concerning are people that really don't have much of an indication of a stone. And if we get time to do it later, I'm going to talk a little bit about management of stones in relation to lap coli. But the issue always comes up is the classic presentation of gallstone pancreatitis. Somebody comes in, they have an attack of pancreatitis, the bilirubin goes up to three, their transaminase is a couple of hundreds. By the next day, they're halfway back to normal, by two or three days later they are normal. And those people, we encourage to send the surgeons to do an IOC on, because almost all of those patients have passed the stone. Almost all of them by the time they come to surgery will have a normal IOC, and they don't have a dilated duct. Now if you have somebody who has a dilated duct, whether or not you can see a stone in it, that's a surrogate marker. So if you've got a 10 mil, you know, if you've got a 25 year old and she's got a 10 millimeter bile duct, that ain't right. So that suggests that there's either current or recent stone in there. And they're safer, you know, the bigger the duct is, the safer the ELCP is. The thing that scares me witless are two millimeter bile ducts that are not easy to get into. You're going to traumatize a lot doing them. Um, and then, you know, you get them pancreatitis, they may not be able to have their lap coli when the surgeon thought they were going to be able to. And so, um, surgeons, when they first started doing lap coli, all did IOCs, they were told to. And now they do it very selectively, they don't do it in every case. But don't let you be the cause of them being lazy. I mean, if, they, if, they, if you don't think that they have a stone there, and they do, then it's, it should be a five minute job for them to put a needle into the cystic duct, take a cholangiogram, and address that issue. So there's some great areas in the middle here. Yeah, sometimes they'll say it wasn't suitable. I couldn't get access. There was a lot of scarring. I couldn't get near the cystic duct. I couldn't get a cholangiogram. We all make you know, allowances, but document it if you do that. This is my reason for doing this. Uh, so I think it's fine uh, for people in the community to go after stones. I don't see a lot of stones except the stones at 8 Manhattan. I mean, I see big, bad, nasty stones, but I think it's fine to, to, for you guys to do them. I'm happy for you to do that. Do you want to take a break, Steve, or what do you want to do?
Yeah, we, we can do a case. 